to the cloud. Great stuff. Right, that's happening now. Okay, thanks for that, Tom. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, I, I'll tell you why I love eclipses in a second, actually. Uh, but I'm Matt, um, and I'm an astrophotographer and a science communicator. Um, I've been doing it for about seven years, uh, and I'm an avid aurora chaser. I lived in the north in the Arctic Circle for altogether maybe about two and a half to three years, uh, deep in the Arctic Circle where we get to about minus 30. Uh, and in my opinion, it's the best place ever. It's absolutely incredible. And it's the place to see the Northern Lights. It's the best place for it. So I will um, share my screen and I will share my talk. So, um, let's play. So hopefully you can all see it. Um, I absolutely love eclipses because they give us a sense of where we are in our solar system. Um, so we can actually see the moon moving in front of the sun and it just blows me away, completely blows me away. Um, so hopefully we'll see a few of you up in Tromso on October the 25th um, for this uh, partial eclipse and maybe we'll get some Northern lights. So um, <clears throat> let me tell you all about it. So the first time I saw the Northern Lights was in 2015, and it was with my nephew, who's the taller guy in this picture, unfortunately. Um, and it was from a wonderful place on the northeast coast of England called Whitley Bay. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it before, um, but this immediately shows you how accessible it is to see the Northern Lights. This is an hour from where my mum lives in Sunderland. We drove for an hour, came up to St Mary's Lighthouse, stepped out, stepped outside of the car and there was something in the sky that I'd never seen before. Um, it was greeny gray hue. Um, it looked like clouds, but I could see stars through it. But once I took a picture, it was green and it was the Northern Lights. And ever since then, I've been addicted and I've wanted to see it every day since. And luckily living in the North, I was able to do that. So we've had a lot of questions about the Northern Lights, um, with the best time to see them, where to see them, um, how to take pictures on your camera. So this talk will cover a lot of that and I'll try and name check those um, who have mentioned it. Um, the why, why we see them is because of this thing that you see on the screen. So this is our sun. This is what we're getting a lot of at the moment. Uh, wonderful clear skies and, and, and hot weather. Um, I quite like it. I don't know if everybody else does, um, but this is why we see the Northern Lights. So the sun is what we orbit around and it's a huge ball of gas at the center of our solar system. And it's extremely active, as you can see from this video from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. The sun's activity, it peaks every 11 years. And when we head into the peak of activity, we see more Northern Lights. Let me just add somebody into the room. Oh, where's the mouse? Don't press them there. Let me go back. Sorry, folks, I'm trying to get somebody into the room. There we are. So because the sun is made of uh, plasma, it's constantly moving. The gas on the sun is constantly moving. And between the equator and the poles of the sun, the gas moves and rotates around the sun at different speeds. The time it takes to orbit around changes. Uh, this motion induces magnetism. And you get magnetic field lines which protrude from the sun. And every 11 years, there's a peak in activity where these magnetic field lines have all twisted up and they're starting to protrude from the surface of the sun. When that happens, we start to see sunspots on the sun. And this happens because we have convection currents flowing on the sun where the hot gas rises to the surface and the magnetic fields as they are protruding from the surface of the sun cap the flow of gas at the surface. They stop this convection a little bit and it causes the surface of the sun to cool down that part. And that's how we get a sunspot. So as you see in this image, the surface of the sun that we see in yellow is seven to 8,000 degrees. And the sunspots in the darkest points are about four and a half thousand. Uh, this sunspot that you see on here, this is one of the largest ones I've seen through a telescope. 
and this is the size of the planet Jupiter. I was hoping for some huge northern lights from the sunspot where they give us absolutely nothing. And that's the joy of the aurora and the sun. You never know what you're going to get. So what happens is you get a buildup of energy within these magnetic field lines. And at a certain point, it will snap. If there's enough energy in there and you'll get a release of charged particles from the sun, which we call a coronal mass ejection or a solar flare. It's basically just the sun belching hot gas. And this can head out into space. And a lot of it, because of the sun's gravity, it falls back down to the sun. So if we want to see the Northern Lights, we want one of these uh, coronal mass ejections to be facing the Earth. We want the Earth to be in the firing line. It can cause damage. Um, it doesn't happen often that it, we can have coronal mass ejections that do damage any infrastructure on the Earth. So don't worry about it. But we would like them facing the Earth so we get more Northern Lights. So it's a bit of pain for pleasure with that one. So what happens next is these charged particles head out into space. And if the Earth's in the firing line, what you'll see is a lot of them are getting deflected in this video. And that's because of the Earth's magnetic field. So this protects us. The magnetic field protects us from these charged particles. But what happens sometimes is depending on the direction of the Earth's magnetic field and where the Earth is in its orbit around the sun, more of these particles can connect with the Earth's magnetic field lines, which emanate from the poles, and then they can be then filtered down to the northern and southern poles. And that's why we get the northern lights, and that is why we get the southern lights. So again, a quick recap. It's an eruption from the sun, which happens quite often. It's facing the Earth, and the charged particles from there head out into space, and if they do, there's a large dense stream of them or the solar wind, which is always coming from the sun is, is strong, then hopefully we'll see some northern lights. The next part that happens is these charged particles will head into the Earth's atmosphere and they will connect with the molecules in the Earth's atmosphere, either oxygen and nitrogen. So depending on what they connect with and excite these molecules, that gives us the color of the northern lights. So if the particles connect and charge an oxygen molecule, they fill it full of energy, it will then release the energy given in a photon of light. So the northern lights is a byproduct of these connections. So if there's a strong event, we'll start to see reds, we'll see oxygen more because that part of the atmosphere 200 kilometers up is more oxygen dense. But if we get a really big storm, and I've seen this only a handful of times, despite living in the north, then we'll get more of these events where we'll start to see the purples and the blues of the northern lights if we get a particularly dense stream. I haven't seen blue yet. I haven't ticked blue off my list, but I have seen red, greens and purples, and it's just absolutely unforgettable. I do hope uh, people that are uh, on this webcast have seen the Northern Lights. If you haven't, you have to get up there and see it. This is why. So this is deep in the Arctic Circle. This isn't too far from Tromso. This is two hours from Tromso. This is me walking out of the house that I was living in. And this is me filming it live. So this is from a camera, which is recording as I walk out. And this is what you see. That looks amazing, Matt. Absolutely it, amazing. It was, it was pretty special. So you see the motion. So for me, the Northern Lights is all about the motion. You do get to see a little bit more colour when, we, when we're in the North. The greens are a little bit more difficult to see. They're quite diffuse. Uh, when it gets bright like this, you do get more of a green tint. Um, it always comes up more on the camera because the camera's sensor is a lot more sensitive than our eyes. But the purples you most definitely see, but you do see the movement. And it's just like in um, Norse mythology, the Biofrost from Thor, which Thor and Odin and all their mates used to cross to go to the seven realms. Um, that's in old Norse mythology, that was the Northern Lights. And it was a rainbow bridge. And you can see from the video why it was thought that the Northern Lights were the gods coming to the seven realms. So 
how do we see it? The further north you are, the more chance you have of seeing the Northern Lights. To see it in the UK, we need a particularly strong storm. Now we can, as we get into solar maximum, which we're heading into now in the next 18 months to two years, there's more chance of us seeing the Northern Lights. I actually saw the Northern Lights from the Northumberland National Park on Tuesday. And it was quite a surprise. We weren't expecting to see it, but I was at an observatory working there. Uh, and they appeared just slightly, not like you saw in the video, but just after midnight. Um, and that was a quite a sporadic but strong storm. So the Northern Lights is the strength of the geomagnetic magnetic storms can be measured on a scale called the KP index. And the higher the number between zero and nine, the further down on the earth from the North Pole, the Northern Lights will reach. So if you're up in the north of Norway, Sweden or Finland, where you always on, offer breaks, then in the red patch, which you'll see, you don't need a strong storm. A KP2, a KP3, you get that every week or two. So if you're in the north, you're going to be seeing it. So if I, when I was living in close to Tromso, if there was seven days of clear skies, I'd be seeing the Northern Lights at least four times, sometimes seven nights a week if it was clear because you're in the best place. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't see it in the UK. It just means you need stronger storms. So if we see the KP index stretching down to a KP6, a KP7, then it, that means it could be overhead in the north of Scotland, Northumberland, and then even visible on the coastlines down to Norfolk. So we need to be keeping an eye, an eye on what's happening on the sun, and then if we're going to get clear skies. So this is taken from the northeast of England. This is uh, Suter Lighthouse, uh, not far from Whitley Bay. Um, and this was taken a couple of years ago. And this is actually taken from Norfolk. Uh, and this wasn't too long ago. So what you'll notice from these two images is one of the questions I get is the best time and the best places to save the Northern Lights. So Richard and Gareth asked this question, the best times to save them. So the best times to save them, obviously when it's dark, you look in between uh, the autumn time and the springtime. Autumn and spring around the equinoxes are generally the best times to see them. But the main thing is you've got to put yourself in the place to see them. And the best places are the coasts. As you can see from these images, you're looking out north over clear views. So you're looking directly north. You don't have mountains in the way. You don't have light pollution. You don't have buildings. You're not in a city. You're away from it all. These are the best places to see it. So if you have access to the coast, if you look where the light pollution is on the image on the right hand side, if you can get north of any coastal light pollution, north of the northeast of England, north of Newcastle Way, you've got a great chance of seeing it. If you look at Norfolk, the north of Wales, Anglesey, fantastic places to see them. If not, you're then looking to get into Northumberland, the Peak District, up into Scotland, places like that. And then any other country around the world in, in North America, Canada, the, it, the rules are exactly the same. Find somewhere high, find a coastal region that has a clear view of north, and then get your camera out and hopefully you'll be able to see it. One thing is for sure, you'll absolutely definitely not see it if you're sitting at home. You have to try and see it. If not, head north. One of the best ways to see it or to find out what's happening is a website called spaceweather.com. And that gives you all the information daily. It's updated as to what's happening on the sun, if we've had any coronal mass ejections, whether they're heading to the earth and what time is best to see them. There's also lots of other nerdy astronomy stuff there for you to see. If you're in the north, you don't even have to go outside. So in Tromso, if you're coming up to Tromso, we will be outside because we want to experience it. But if you put yourself in the best position, this is me uh, on an island called Senya, uh, look, just looking out the window, looking at the Northern Lights. If you put yourself in the position, you're definitely going to see them. But to be able to do this, I have to know everything that I've told you before. So I have to have an idea of what's happening on the sun, not how the sun works, but what's happening on the sun. Has there been a coronal mass ejection and is it directed to the Earth? And most importantly, is it going to be clear? We can't see the northern lights through clouds. 
can't see anything through clouds. So clouds are the astronomer's enemy. So we need some clear skies, but that's potluck. That's just the look of the draw. And if you're looking, this is what you'll see. Good memories, Tom. He's just showing off. No, it's just, you know, it's absolutely, it's addictive. Like seeing an eclipse, it's completely addictive. And Tom will agree with this. And everyone from Aurora Zone who's been up to the north to see it, it's, it's, it's hard. Thing to, for me. It's hard to go and see the northern lights once. It's sort of like aurora chasing is sort of a given, and there are two kinds of aurora chasers. There are aurora chasers like me that live in London and then dream about going a few times a year, and then there are aurora chasers like Matt who just go and live there and spend a whole a whole section of his life there. So that's kind of the scale of aurora chaser. There's probably one level above that that's truly insane, but. Uh, yeah. There is no zero Aurora chaser. Once you've seen it, you will want to see it again. That's the beautiful thing I think about, um, about the Northern Lights is the promise. You really never know when you're going to get your best sighting of the Northern Lights. There's always this uh, promise that the next time you go, it's going to be even better than it was the last time. Yeah, definitely. Do you have a, a one moment, one unforgettable moment of seeing the Northern Lights that kind of springs to mind? Yeah, I, well, it's funny because um, when I think about seeing the Northern Lights, I always sort of think about it as quite a solitary activity, like a very meditative, contemplative thing. But the reality is that the best experiences I can remember have all involved groups of people, especially first time um, mm -hmm. Aurora chasers who've come out and, and even families with young children who are really mesmerized because they see the Northern Lights as a as almost a form of magic, really. You know, the science uh, isn't as uh, much of a concern to them. and. Uh, I can remember, I think it was a, a storm around Valentine's Day, a geomagnetic storm around Valentine's Day of 2013, being in uh, South Central Iceland and being with a group of about 20 people who'd never seen the Northern Lights before. And we experienced 45 minutes of activity that it's very similar to what you're seeing on the screen here. And as Matt's saying, uh, you know, the colors are much more subtle that you see with your eyes. Um, but the movement is what really makes it special. And it's, we're, we're very lucky that Matt's sharing these um, beautiful real time videos of the Northern Lights, because until relatively recently, most of the footage that you've seen of the Northern Lights has been time lapses and they don't represent the true speed. And the beautiful thing about these uh, dynamic auroras is that they can be docile for, for 30 seconds and then they can explode with motion for a few seconds and they can calm down again. And I've seen storms where 30 minutes of continuous motion, it was almost too much. And in the end, you just had people lying down on their back, trying to use the entire field of vision of their eyes to take in as much of the sky as possible. It was overwhelming. Most people couldn't even speak really for, for an hour or two afterwards. They were just absorbing it. Um, it was really mind blowing. So, uh, yeah. That's, that's, that's my memory. <laughs> that's my lasting memory. But you know, the promise is always that, well, it could be better. I often think back way back in the history of Aurora uh, science to the great storm of 1859, um, known as the Carrington event by solar physicists, when uh, a, a huge coronal mass ejection, that's a storm from the sun, struck the Earth's magnetic field. And the auroras which erupted were seen in Hawaii. So basically, both hemispheres of the Earth were covered with auroras. And uh, if an event like that was to happen again today, um, it would be devastating for our infrastructure. It would cause massive problems for satellites, for our electrical grids. And that's kind of a shame because I think in the minds of most Aurora chasers, we kind of secretly hope that something like that will happen, even though it would be considered a disaster <laughs> for infrastructure, just to see auroras over every city on earth at the same time, or every night side on the night side of the earth, it would be absolutely amazing. Yeah, you'd have no street lights, so you'd have everyone would be seeing some part of the Milky Way as well. So in a way, it sounds, it sounds amazing, but the cleanup afterwards probably wouldn't be great. Um, but yeah, I think for me, I've seen it a few times. The first time with my nephew was great to share it with him. I saw it with my uh, my little mum last couple of years ago in Norway, which to see her reaction was um, 
was unforgettable and it, it's the sharing thing for me it's I've had a lot of times where I've just been lying on my back taking pictures of it or just taking it in but anything within astronomy for me and I think why I love communicating it as well is it's it's the sharing part of it and to hear everyone's reactions and that people can be spread out all over the hotels that that we kind of offer uh with the aurora zone and you can hear people screaming from all directions of the hotel because they're just seeing the lights dance everywhere for the first time and i'm able to get pictures for people under the lights and um yeah i think for me that's that's the best feeling really there was one time in norway where i can only describe it as some it was like something higher than us poured a tin of paint just over the sky directly above my head and the whole sky just filled it just filled with the northern lights and i just left the camera i thought what's the point i can't do anything i can't do this justice and it was just everywhere um very very lucky to see it uh and that's definitely something i'll, I'll never forget you know it's no surprise that when when i look at the questions that were sent in ahead of this uh ahead of this webinar there are many questions about photographing the northern lights i wrote a whole chapter at the end of the book because i know it's really everybody wants to take a picture and i totally understand that but mm. you mustn't uh you mustn't let yourself get carried away with the pictures if it's happening just take it in because um it's it is it will be emblazoned on your memory in a way that it's almost impossible to describe to other people and matt you've done such a good job here of conveying the experience through your own personal experience of, of living out there i think it's wonderful and yet there's almost no word in the english language that really goes far enough i think to actually capture the 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 feeling that you will get from being there um i don't think it's surprising that the northern lights tops every single bucket list on the internet if you go mm. on the internet and type in bucket list it doesn't matter which site you click on you can go through five pages of google and every single result northern lights will be at the top of that bucket list it's actually more popular than even than total solar eclipses which of course are absolutely majestic in their own way yeah yeah and i i can totally understand why and again i, I keep saying it and it's totally about putting yourself in the place and, and increasing your chances of seeing it um to answer the one of the main questions which is where um you are looking in the north of scandinavia the north of norway sweden finland um iceland gets mentioned quite a lot where where tom had his moment um and iceland is a fantastic country to see the lights it's um in fact to see the northern lights in iceland is kind of like the cherry on top i think because it's, it's such a wonderful country um, but the thing about Iceland for me is the weather is a lot more temperamental than what it is in the UK. So it's um, it's very it's kind of difficult to, to see it there. I would normally go up on on a whim, which I know isn't um, ideal for a lot of people. But yeah, in the very north of the Scandic countries in Iceland uh, is the best place to see it. We talked a little bit about photography as well as if you read my mind Tom you think we planned this uh, I was going to ask because there was a question I know um with the there was a couple of questions on what the kind of things mode that you need to put your cameras into and settings yeah we um we, there was there was quite a few of them I've got Chris Sarah John and Ken asked about camera settings so We've got this thing in, in photography, which I'll not, I'll not blab on about too much, called the exposure triangle. So initially, what you need to do is set your camera to manual, make sure it's on a tripod and pointing north. Also, make sure you're wrapped up warm, um, because if you're seeing the northern lights, it's going to be night and it's highly likely that it's going to be cold. Um, but the exposure triangle is basically three, three different settings on your camera when it's set to manual. It's the ISO, which is the sensitivity of your camera sensor. That can go from anything to from 100, which isn't as sensitive. That is a camera setting that we probably use in the daytime when we have a lot of light. Up to the new cameras now can go up to, blimey, what is it, 320,000 or something like that, Tom? It's, yeah, they... So some of the new kind of mirrorless uh, full frame cameras are incredible at low light. Uh, it's almost yeah. the pace of sort of new low light camera technology is so fast. It's quite hard to uh, to keep up as a as a deep sky or aurora photographer. Yeah, I think every, even every few when years, I it's, it's five times time. better. 
when I spend time in uh, Finland with the Eurozone, um, I don't even think mirrorless cameras were on the market then, and it wasn't too long ago. And now they allow us to get image videos like that where we can record it live. So the ISO is quite an important setting on the camera. Um, then you have your exposure time. That's the length of time that you're taking an image for. Uh, when we take an image during an evening at night, when it's low light, we need to be taking the picture for a prolonged period of time. So you're looking at least 10, 12 seconds, anything more than that. It all depends on what's happening during that night, if there's a moon out, et cetera. Um, but this exposure triangle, each setting kind of counteracts the other one. So it's all about getting to know your kit. The final one is the, the focal length or the f-stop. And this is the, uh, the width of the uh, lens, the camera lens that you have, have attached to your camera. That can go down to 1.4, which means it's extremely wide. And it, it can also go up quite high. And that allows you to, that changes things like your depth of field. But what I always say with this is keep the number as low as you can, as low as you can go to let enough light in as you possibly can. And then you're not pushing it with all the other settings. So a bit confusing this, so we'll not dwell on it too much. But the higher the ISO, the more grainier your image is. And if you want lovely pictures for Instagram to get lots of likes, then grainy images kind of won't cut the mustard. So you want to find a happy medium between your ISO and your shutter speed. There was one question also about um, the Northern Lights changes so much. How do you manage to get your images with it being so changeable, with it being like a toddler, just sitting like Tom says, being quite settled, nothing happening really in the sky to completely exploding it. Like, what do you do with your camera in front of you? And that is, just like riding a bike, as soon as you get used to your settings, as soon as you're changing from, from your seconds from 10 down to five to four seconds, if it's quite a fast display, that's how you kind of get used to it. But the settings that I would say uh, would be probably 15 to 20 seconds for your exposure time. Put your focal aperture down as low as you possibly can and set your ISO up at around 3,200 to 6,400, something like that. Generally, with the newer cameras, they handle the ISO a little bit more, a little bit better. Um, so if you have an older camera, you'll see your ISO generally won't get too high, um, but you will get pictures of the Northern Lights with it. But if your camera has an, a long exposure noise reduction setting built in, it's actually mm -hmm. usually very effective to leave that enabled. Um, yeah, okay. Your manufacturer will come up with a kind of noise reduction algorithm that's unique to the sensor in your camera. It's unique to the ISO that you've enabled and it will it will kind of add time to that it takes to take the shot. You'll find that after the shot's finished, there's kind of a pause while the noise reduction is performed. But it can be very effective. So I, I, I thoroughly recommend leaving that on for this particular kind of uh, nighttime photography. Do you have a um, favorite image that you've taken? A favorite or... image or any image? Yeah, um, favorite. yeah I, I think um, that is a really good question, actually. That is a good question. I've never really thought about what's my favorite Aurora photo. Um, I have a photo of myself with the Northern Lights, which is, which I've used millions of times for um for sort of pr and that sort of thing uh when mm. promoting the book and uh, that was actually taken in iceland um and kind of similar to to the picture you've got up now it just has the duality of color the green and also a bit of the pink and violet color that was one of the things that was brought up in the questions was about the color spectrum of the northern lights and i think matt did mm. such a good job of covering the um, the extraordinary diversity of color the green is so prominent because it's it's formed from oxygen in our atmosphere um, and uh, there are many other colors attributed to nitrogen in our atmosphere which is actually the most common gas in our atmosphere but if you can imagine a nitrogen atom it's it's quite small compared to an oxygen atom so when your electrons are, are precipitating down raining down through the atmosphere an oxygen atom is a big target whereas a nitrogen atom is quite a small one so we do predominantly see green from the lights there are also um, ultraviolet emissions from the northern lights and uh, 
we see that too on other planets, planets like Jupiter and Saturn, which both generate ultraviolet auroras. They're not unique to the Earth. But on the Earth, we do have, we're very lucky actually to have such beautiful visible auroras. I, I would say we're we're truly blessed actually with the skies that we get on our planet, considering how um, how many other worlds there are in the solar system and how little they seem to get. And that's not just the case with auroras, it's true for eclipses as well. We had a, a question about um, about being able to see eclipses. And um, actually, we, we also had a question about the rarity of eclipses from Lauren. Uh, Lauren simply asked, what is the rarest eclipse? And if you're an eclipse chaser, truly the white whale of, of eclipse chasers is to see something called a hybrid eclipse. They're very rare. That's where you get an eclipse which starts as an annular and ends as a total or vice versa. Um, and in order for that to happen, the moon has to actually change distance from you during the totality of the eclipse, which is typically only a couple of minutes long, significantly enough that it can either no longer obscure the sun or it can obscure the sun. Um, and that's really quite unusual. Uh, the rarest eclipses usually are total solar eclipses. Hybrid eclipses are rarer still, but total solar eclipses are certainly um, the most dramatic. And, um, and actually, we had another question from uh, Kelly, who asks, uh, what makes eclipses possible? Would they still happen if the moon was at a different distance from the Earth or the sun? And Kelly, you're absolutely right that if the moon was a different distance from the Earth and the sun, we wouldn't have the fortuitous circumstances that we do to see eclipses that are total. Um, because if the moon is too far away from the Earth, it, it no longer appears large enough at any point in its orbit to actually fully cover the face of the sun. Um, and that will be the case in about 50 million years time or thereabouts, because the moon is receding from the earth at a rate of about one and a half inches, uh, per year. So there will be a point in the future of, um, hopefully human civilization, hopefully we'll still be around in some capacity where we will no longer be able to see total eclipses. And, uh, for that reason, I think it's well worth going to see them now, but partial eclipses, fortunately, um, are going to be around for a while. Um, and there was a question about the history of eclipses too. I'm just trying to find who asked that question. Um, but the question. Find that about... for you if you like, John. I'm sorry, could you go say could, that again? Find that for you. Thank you. Yes. The question I remember was about how long we've been able to forecast eclipses for and, and when forecasting of eclipses uh, first became possible. And. Um, Robert. I think it was. Robert, thank you so much for your question. I really like that one because I had to actually think about that. I had to look into that. Um, and the answer is, as far as I can tell, uh, as with many things in astronomy, the answer goes back to the Royal Babylonian astronomers um, who were truly ahead of their time in most cases. Uh, Babylonian astronomers actually wrote about the Northern Lights, can you believe, as well, a very long time ago. Um, but they did become, as far as we know, the first people to forecast eclipses as long ago as about uh, four and a half thousand years. Think about that. Um, that's actually unbelievable to me. But there you go. They were able to forecast eclipses around four and a half thousand years ago. And that's just as well because eclipses have been used throughout the history of astronomy to measure the size of the solar system, to measure the distance to the moon. Uh, and we even had uh, ancient Greek philosophers speculating on the shape of the earth by looking at the moon and by looking at the earth's shadow on the moon um, and indeed by trying to understand the moon's shadow on the earth as well so we're very lucky in some ways that we have eclipses because they've helped to advance our understanding and of course they just happen to be absolutely stunning um, as are the northern lights we've um yeah i think we've known for hundreds of years that the earth is definitely not flat as well and that's <laughs> eclipses, isn't it? so that's I love that about eclipses. We um we got a super moon question? tonight as well, haven't we? Yeah, is it a super moon tonight? Yeah, yes. Uh, so this morning, technically last night, going into this morning at around about three in the morning, uh, we had the full moon, and yeah, it was a super moon, a last in a series of four sequential um super moons or to use what i would consider to be the correct term a near perigee full moon so actually going back to what we were talking about with eclipses the moon's orbit isn't circular so sometimes it's at its farthest distance from the earth that's called the apogee point uh, and in that case it cannot cover the face of the sun so we see an annular eclipse sometimes it's at its nearest uh position in its orbit to the earth that's the lunar perigee and um, and actually the moon reaches a lunar perigee every 27 and a half days so 
a lunar perigee isn't uncommon, but if the lunar perigee coincides with the full moon, then the moon is at its brightest and its largest uh, in that particular uh, period of time. And that's colloquially called a super moon. But we do technically get a super moon every month. It's just that when it's a full moon, then it tends to make the news. And uh, not only do we have a super moon right now, but we also have the peak of the Perseid meteor shower, uh, which is another wonderful astronomy event in the calendar. And that's just a little unfortunate this year because uh, meteor showers and full moons uh, mm -hmm. tend to be at odds with one another as the light of the full moon makes the fainter meteors hard to see. But the Perseids are a very strong performer. There are lots of bright fireball meteors with the Perseids. So if you do go out over the next couple of nights and stay out nice and late, I would suggest up to, a, to at least one or two in the morning if you can. Yeah. Um, you stand a very good chance of seeing bright meteors racing away from the east, going to other parts of the sky. And those would be Perseid meteors. Uh, I've, I've witnessed those. They're absolutely amazing. Um, up, up near Kielder, Matt, a yeah. few years ago, I, I saw some amazing um meteor showers up there yeah we got we were getting quite a few on tuesday night uh but one of my first times at, in fact my first time at keeler was the perseids um and we were seeing 60 to 70 an hour um yeah. and again that's like the northern yeah. lights because you hear people screaming from all over from yeah. where you are because everyone's seeing them and it's just it's a, it's another great um astronomy group activity for people of, yeah. of all ages aurora hunting eclipse hunting and uh, and it's and, and it's these moments that get people addicted and it, it'll be the, the same for tom i remember um a partial eclipse um god i can't even remember what year it was uh when i was quite young when it was full in cornwall it was a total in cornwall uh, but i had a partial in in sunderland and that's one of my first astronomy memories um along with you must have been about two years before. old Matt. that was in 1999 yeah, two. Thanks for the compliment. Um, <laughs> only ten years younger than me. Yeah. Um, well, wow, what was that? Thirteen. Thirteen then. So, um, yeah, it's, it's those moments that you just don't forget. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, they're, they're uh, we big have moments. One, one question that we haven't uh, that we haven't covered that I actually spoke to you about today, Tom, because I sat and thought. Do, will it affect it? And global warming's very much um, a topic that we're seeing on the news quite a lot, especially with down south in London getting over 40 degrees, which is just absolutely terrifying. Uh, the question was, will global warming affect us being able to see the Northern Lights? So I messaged Tom about this because I wasn't 100% sure. But what did you say? Yeah, there actually several people asked a variation of this question about the effect of climate change on the Northern mm. Lights. And it's a really interesting thing to think about. And when I was writing my book about the Northern Lights, I, I remember even at the time wondering to myself if there was something happening. And, and this should be relevant to any modern guide to seeing the Northern Lights. So I did do a bit of digging at the time, and I have gone back today just to think about that. As far as I can see, there's no... Um, appreciable effect on the northern lights from climate change and uh, climate change is occurring it, you know in the earth's biosphere so our atmosphere is made up of several layers the one that's right down just above our heads is the troposphere just above that is the stratosphere and above that is is a much larger envelope of of tenuous gas that we call the ionosphere um, and auroras are generally formed in the ionosphere with uh, some of the lowest parts of the auroral curtain just dipping into the upper stratosphere. Um, but the troposphere, which is much closer to the ground, that is where we live and that is the a part of the atmosphere for which the composition is being significantly changed. So carbon dioxide is a heavy, heavy molecule. So it stays closer to the surface of the Earth, not much carbon dioxide up, up there in the stratosphere. Um, and carbon dioxide is our... Uh, is like our thermostat for for the Earth's climate. You know, we don't have to actually change the quantity, the relative quantity of carbon dioxide, very much um, to make to crank the thermostat quite far um, and to make you know sweeping adjustments in the overall global temperature. So by just nudging that up, we are pushing the temperature rise to to go much higher. And the risk, of course, is there could be a runaway effect as well um, as the biosphere responds. So in terms of the visibility of the northern lights. It shouldn't make really any difference to us because the northern lights is a phenomenon by which 
solar wind, you know, space weather material, plasma from the sun, interacts with the ionosphere, the very highest parts of the Earth's atmosphere, uh, and the Earth's magnetic field. And those things are not significantly changing. But I think it is worth bearing in mind um, that, of course, you know, we might see changes in, in our own travel habits. You know, we may even see restrictions in travel. Um, there are ways that travel itself could be impacted by climate change, and that might impact, you know, the regularity with which we travel to see the lights or the, the way, perhaps, that we travel. And you know, maybe it would make sense for us to, to travel in a different way and to have an extended stay um, and get, you know, a longer experience of seeing the lights rather than kind of hopping back and forward on a plane. Um, if you're an aurora chaser, that might be the way that you do it right now. But then, of course, there are also sometimes just on occasion, times when the Northern Lights will come to you. Of course, uh, for Matt living, uh, you know, up in the north, he gets a fantastic regular view. And I think, Matt, I've seen just now from the Aurora Alerts UK that tonight's going to be another really good night. So I look forward to seeing the pictures tomorrow from where you are. Not so much luck from where I am. But we did have a couple of questions about the UK. We had one from Gary who asked uh, what conditions are required for Northern Lights to appear in the UK. And strictly, the conditions are, are no different than anywhere else. Uh, the conditions are the sky has to be dark enough and the auroral oval has to be big enough and that's about all there is to it but of course in the uk we don't we don't consider ourselves to be in the auroral zone um, because we don't regularly see the northern lights here um, but when the auroral oval expands then auroras can become visible across the uk and we've seen uh, from matt's diagrams there's this number which describes the general activity of the lights it's called the planetary k index or the kp number uh, and uh, it goes up to nine. And uh, when the KP number is nine, then the auroral oval is actually almost covering the UK at that point, uh, going right down to latitudes of around about 50 degrees. So actually going to, to London or the South Coast even. Um, and that's usually represents a geomagnetic storm. So right now, oddly enough, the UK is getting more aurora sightings than parts of the Arctic. And that's because here in the UK, the nights are dark enough and the aurora is active enough for that trade-off to occur. Whereas in the Arctic, the nights are still not quite dark enough because yeah. of the northern summer. Um, and they're not getting the, uh, the darkness of night necessary. They're still seeing the twilight all night long. So at this moment in August, we're getting some remarkable sightings, extraordinary sightings. And people are talking about the beginning of the season, you know, in early August, which is kind of unheard of, really. It's usually a sort of late August, early September thing. And I think that's because the um, the awareness of, of auroras has gone up thanks to all the aurora alerts apps and services that can make you aware of when it's going to happen. But there was another question I wanted to pick up on. I really, I really find this one interesting. It's from Chris. And Chris says, years ago in Sussex, so that's actually south of where I am in London, I was convinced I saw the Northern Lights. Is that possible? So going back to what we were just saying, the answer is it is possible. Um, if it could be seen in Hawaii in 1859, and if it could be seen in ancient Greece every couple of hundred years, then it certainly can be seen in Sussex. And it would depend, I think, on what year that was and if you can recall that. But I have a friend and a mentor called John Mason, and he's a he's a great aurora chaser. And uh, John once told me a story in the mid '90s of seeing the Northern Lights from London, where I live now. And I think how extraordinary that must have been, uh, you know, for for anyone. But of course, while the Northern Lights and the awareness of them are going up, light pollution is also on the rise. So if you do live in Sussex, years ago perhaps you could see the Northern Lights. Nowadays, maybe even the bright display that you saw years ago wouldn't compete with the light pollution in Sussex now. I don't know for sure. It's not a terribly scientific answer, but never say never. And if you get interested in Aurora and you start following the space weather, following spaceweather.com, the site that Matt was showing us earlier, keeping in touch with the geomagnetic activity, then maybe, you know, if you're getting, if you're wanting to get a taste of the lights before you book your trip, you just might get a view uh, in the UK or where you live now. Um, and that might just be enough to, to whet your appetite before you travel and see it for real. Okay, thank, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Matt. Um, I think we've covered most of the questions. Um, I've got a couple that um, Sue's kind of pointed out to me that we haven't covered. Um, one of them is from um, Ken Case. He's asked, is it possible to hear a sound from um, the Northern Lights? 
Have you ever heard the Aurora noise, Matt? I've heard about the Aurora noise, but the, what happens is when I think the Aurora noise that I hear tends to be me running in the snow, racing to get my camera. So that's the only Aurora noise that I tend to hear. And then whatever profanity is coming out of my mouth at the time. But I've heard that certain people might hear some crackling in the sky, things like that. I'm just but... imagining some researchers somewhere in Norway setting up these ultra sensitive mics and they're just hearing these profanities just, <laughs> just carrying Matt. through the cool <laughs> Arctic air from miles away. And it's just Matt, it's like the clicking sound of his Matt. camera and Matt swearing profusely and running yeah. around getting excited and they record it and report it in a scientific paper as an unknown phenomenon. Is it, yeah, in this weird northern accent. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're living in strange times and I feel like that's just possible now that, that times have become strange enough. Well, you know, there was a long history of uh, scientists dismissing the so-called aurora noise as what they would have called a psychoacoustic phenomenon. So uh, mm. less so us uh, tramping around in the snow and more so just looking at the not light and being so overwhelmed that you just start to hear what you're seeing in your head because you're sort of having an induced hallucination um, in one of the other senses. But, but researchers have recorded the sound of the Northern Lights. Uh, researchers at Aalto University in Finland have made very comprehensive recordings of the sound. They've even proposed a mechanism for how it happens. And uh, it does indeed form popping, snapping and crackling sounds, which in old legends of the Northern Lights have often been likened to uh, people playing in snow. One of my favorite legends is about, uh, is about um, some, uh, some boys, uh, I think this is a legend from the Northern Territories, you know, parts of, parts of what is now Canada. Um, and an indigenous legend there talks about uh, some boys playing football with a walrus skull. Uh, in the sky. And as they tramp around through the snow with the leaves in it, they make all these crackling sounds. One of the islands in the area flipped the legend round and had a bunch of walruses playing football with a human skull. So that's my kind of people. They had a, a slightly dark twist on that legend. But of course, the fact that there were so many stories about the lights making noises, I just think it was worth looking into. And so did the Alto researchers. So they've proposed a mechanism called um, an atmospheric inversion layer. So this is basically where uh, there's a kind of pocket of warm air um, in the in the sky after sunset. And the air is so steady that uh, the ground cools down and the air above is cooler and a sort of pocket of warm air gets trapped. And that pocket of air acts a little bit like a, a lid to to uh, to trap static electricity. And when the static electricity jumps across the gap and this is only happening, it might be, you know, 150, 200 meters above the ground. When that static electricity jumps the gap, you hear the discharge as kind of crackling, popping and snapping. And that static electricity is being induced by the lights much lower than the lights are visible. So the actual electrical current of the northern lights is coming down into the ground and it's just generating enough static electricity only because of that atmospheric um, inversion layer. So it turns out that you just have to have certain atmospheric conditions for the phenomenon to occur. And, you know, you need to have somebody out looking. They need to be out in a remote site at just the time that that atmospheric inversion layer occurred. And that's why those reports were somewhat sparse and, and easy to dismiss by people who are skeptical. But the, to answer your question, the Aurora noise is real and it is a white whale. It's a white whale for Aurora yeah. chase. It's like the hybrid eclipse. It's now, <laughs> it's now on everyone's list, including my own, to see and hear the Aurora at the same time. Yeah. And Matt, you, you know, if I hear Matt swearing over the horizon, I'm going to be shouting back. I'll be like, shut up. I'm listening to the Aurora. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying nothing at all now because I haven't heard this at all. Um, all right. so definitely on the bucket list. Um, so I think we've answered the majority of the questions. If anyone has got any questions, if you just pop it in the chat in the next five minutes and then we'll, we'll try and see if we can catch Tom and Matt. Um, before we sign off. Um, we do have some spare books. Um, I've dropped an email address in the chat for everyone to contact Craig if you would like a, a signed copy. Um, the first 50 registrants are already getting theirs, um, but we do have some spare ones if anyone would like one. There's a diagram um, of the Aurora noise in that book. So if, you, if you're interested in Aurora page. noise... <laughs> what page? I'm going to look that up while you what talk page? and then I'll show you. Okay. 
Um, so we do have an eclipse trip coming up in Tromsø in Norway on the 25th of October. And the lovely Matt is actually going to be your tour guide. What page are we on? Page, page? Uh, page 71. 71, okay. Um, so, oh, is it that one? That's the one. That's the one. There's your noise diagram. Yep. Um, so we do have a, a, a partial eclipse trip coming up in Tromsø on the 25th of October. And the lovely Matt is going to be your guide for, is it three nights? Yep, three nights. Um, and I believe that Craig has popped that into the chat if anyone's interested in having a look at that. Um, that involves going up to the planetarium and also going out on a husky ride, Matt. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's, got a husky uh, ride. Yeah, yeah, just checking, just checking. Yeah, so we've got Northern Lights um, hunting on huskies, which is one of the best ways to see the Northern Lights. Um, and um, if there's anything else, I think we've just got one chat here from, is it Brian? Let me just pan Matt. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow. Minus 38. Wow. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Um, any more questions before we kind of wrap up? You guys, we got any more questions? No, no. Anyone else on the chat? Okay, I think, I think we're almost done. Um, Matt, I think you're still hosting. I believe I am. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. You can stay hosting, that's fine. That's not a problem. Um, just thank you very much for joining us this, this evening, Tom and Matt and everyone else that's joined us as well. Um, and um, hopefully you will see the Northern Lights at some point soon. We're looking forward. I'm going out at some point. Hopefully I will see them as well. <laughs> Never seen them myself. Can't wait. Very excited. Um, I will point out as well that both Matt and I are on Twitter. Um, Matt's probably more prolific on social media than I am. And uh, so if you want to get in touch and share your pictures of the eclipse as well, I'm sure I can speak for Matt when I say that we'd love to see those pictures. It's always oh, yeah, great to see people great. going out and yeah. uh, and and engaging but just to reiterate what i said right at the beginning please be safe when it comes to eclipse viewing um, and you know play it safe and you'll enjoy it and you'll you'll have a really good memory that doesn't involve going to the hospital <laughs> uh, and also thanks for your message rebecca that's really sweet thank you very much and we'll get a book out to you as well um uh yes hopefully i won't break my ankle again on another trip <laughs> sat with a broken ankle yeah <laughs> um okay thank you very much everyone good evening and um we'll speak to you all soon thank you bye-bye bye-bye thanks everyone thank you